greetings from Mobility Outlook and welcome to Mobility Conversation. Today we have with us Mr. Lars Tenquist, Executive Vice President and Volvo Group Trax Technology and Chief Technology Officer of AB Volvo. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Nice to catch up with you. First, let me ask you, what made you to come here? Well, uh, you know, uh, Bangalore and India is very important for us in our global R&D organization. Mm -hmm. uh, Bangalore is now the second biggest site in the Volvo Group R&D. And uh, during the pandemic, yeah. it was not possible to travel. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I've not been here since 2019. So now was really the time to catch up and go here and, and meet our big team that we have in Bangalore and uh, meet the all fantastic engineers that we have here to follow the progress. Mm -hmm. I can tell you a lot has happened since uh, last time I was here. Okay, that's interesting. So I think Volvo has uh, a target of achieving net zero greenhouse gas by 2030. I'm um, oh, sorry, 20, 2040, you know, from the manufacturing of it, etc. How have you laid the roadmap for Volvo? For us, it has been very clear that uh, we, we, we are committed to the Paris Agreement, meaning that we believe that the planet needs a fossil free road transport system by 2050. And for us, that means that since our vehicles are operating for approximately 10 years on the road, the 2050 turned to 2040. That's why we have stated fossil free solutions, 100% fossil free solutions from the world of Group 2040. We have then done a thorough investigation on what technologies we believe that we will need in order to deliver on that promise. And we believe that there is not one single silver bullet. We believe that we need several technologies in parallel to meet this. We believe that we will need battery electric vehicles. We are already in production with that. We believe that we need fuel cell electric vehicles and then fuel cells running on green hydrogen. But we also believe that we need combustion engines going forward. But then combustion engines running on truly renewable fuels. You also have the challenges to cut CO2 by 40% per vehicle kilometer. So what's the roadmap for how are you going to achieve this? On the one side, you have uh, several issues on tackling the manufacturing per se. On the other hand, you have issues relating to the products that you make. Yes. So two things. Yeah. So how do you plan to achieve those targets? Well, I think the, um, the CO2 is divided into the emissions that uh, is coming out of the vehicles when they are in use, the Scoop 3 and science-based targets. But uh, part of the science Scoop 3 is also then the manufacturing footprint of the vehicles. And that means that our commitment is also then to be fossil-free when it comes to the manufacturing footprint of the vehicles mm -hmm. until 2040. And that means, for example, mm. that we need to go to the use of fossil-free steel. Mm. And already last year, we showcased a partnership with the Swedish SSAB. steel manufacturers, SSAB, with uh, the world's first vehicle-based uh, built. That's a construction vehicle. It was a construction vehicle that we then showcased and built upon fossil-free steel. Then. But the same goes for plastics, for example, for interior in the cab must also be replaced by fossil free materials. Uh, rather much of the CO2 footprint today comes from electronics, mm. must also be solved then. So a lot of focus on the manufacturing footprint. And the emissions out of the vehicles, um, it's not only connected to what we are designing, it's of course also connected to what kind of energy that is available across the, uh, the world. Uh, I mean, there is no use that we are developing battery electric vehicles if it will be used for electricity coming out of uh, coal-powered power plants, for example. Uh, so it is, of course, a rather complicated uh, chain of players that need to interact together in order to deliver on what the planet is asking for. You also talked about you know, electric vehicles and manufacturing. If you can explain to me how you're planning your manufacturing process. What we are doing is that, you know, in our industry, uh, a vehicle is not a standard vehicle. Mm -hmm. A vehicle is tailor-made according to the specifications of a customer, meaning that we are offering a, an enormous variety of different combinations. The customer can decide two axles or three axles or four axles. Mm -hmm. uh, 
the, the distance between the axles, the different kind of cabs, mm -hmm. uh, the different kind of engines, transmissions, etc. Uh, and that means that we have a fantastic Lego system today that we can offer our customers. Mm -hmm. Now we are electrifying that very offer of vehicles. We are not, so we are not starting from scratch with the electric vehicles. Okay. We are building on very well quality assured solutions and providing that to our customers. Uh, and by that we will also then be agnostic in our production. Mm. So we will use what we call the mixed model assembly. On the same assembly lines we are assembling vehicles with combustion engines, vehicles with uh, battery electric propulsions and will be with fuel electric propulsion as well on the same uh, assembly lines. This will make us a little bit agnostic also to the uptake of the different technologies on the different markets because I think it's fair to say that it's rather hard to predict exactly what the share will be of technology A, B and C and when it will happen on the different markets and by having the possibility then to assemble on the same assembly line will give us a lot of flexibility. Absolutely. But at the same time, uh, considering the manufacturing operation, the tag time, no? the, st the time between two stations, yes. that will vary because uh, in, in, in the conventional IC you have a lot of implements to be added, whereas in the electric, correct me if I'm wrong, there are number of modules are very limited. No, I, I wouldn't say yes. that that, uh, that is so true. And what our, our our philosophy when it comes to production is that you you have the the variance and the variation. Uh, that is where you, where you use your pre-assemblies, and the pre-assemblies are connected to the main line like a fish bow, and that means that on the main line you have less of variation. And that means that, that that variation that you will have, you need to solve that on your pre-assemblies going into the main line. And we see that that is possible to do also then with this variation of technologies going forward. Sometime back when I met you, you said that you learn to fail as it will help you in enriching your knowledge and also uh, you know, enhance your capabilities. If you can, is this uh, concept still viable for the new uh, technologies? No, but it's, it's very important to have this mindset that it is okay to fail mm -hmm. or it's okay to learn. I think that that is even more important uh, because it is about learning. Mm -hmm. uh, when you are doing something that is not working out, mm -hmm. then you are learning and uh, most likely you will not give up with that failure but you will use that learning, that competence uh, enhancement mm -hmm. when you take on the next, next challenge. Mm -hmm. So very seldom a failure is a complete failure that we stop, okay. but it's something that we are learning from and then we take it from there. So you know, leading an R&D organization, you can say, what is the output of an R&D organization? Is it the products we are developing or is it the competence that we are enhancing? And I think it is more the competence that we are delivering. With all the disruptions happening now, is it difficult to predict the future? Yes. Unlike in the past? No, it's, it's much more, it's much harder to predict the future today than in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, in the past, uh, if I'm a little bit sloppy, mm -hmm. uh, you could look back a few years and then you could extrapolate that development in the upcoming years and then you knew approximately how much more do I need to work on the fuel efficiency? How much do I work on, need to work on other features as well? Mm -hmm. This was rather much a linear progression or linear development. Today, we are taking steps into unknown territories. We are taking steps into unknown technologies. Mm -hmm. uh, I dare to say that uh, for the very first time in our industry, I think that some players might fail, mm -hmm. <coughs> meaning that they take the wrong decisions, mm -hmm. truly wrong decisions. So. The risks are bigger today mm. and that also means that uh, we need to be more humble than in the past. Mm. You cannot write a very detailed specification today, really saying that in three years or five years I need to be exactly here or there. That means that when you're working together with suppliers and other partners, you also have to be more open-minded and most likely you also need to agree together that we cannot specify everything. We have to agree upon that in two years we might change the specification a little bit mm -hmm. and we need to be open to change it and we need to be very, very agile in the true sense of the word than to, to, to be flexible going forward. 
So it's a, I'd have to say it's a big change than in the past, where it was easy to predict the future. Today, it's harder, more exciting, and more fun. Harder, exciting, and fun. Yeah. Perfect. Three different uh, corners you are being pulled apart. You know, there is always a trade-off. You know, but uh, how will you take a decision? <laughs> no, I, I think that's important that you understand when you need to take the decisions. Uh, sometimes you can still work with some open doors and then you close door by door sort of until you are at a certain point in time where you really need to have, take the, the hard decision. I think that uh, that also goes for different parts uh, of a vehicle mm. that you uh, that you, you cannot as in the past you know we had a gate uh, stage gate uh, development process where everything needed to be ready at the same time that's not true anymore uh, you have to understand where you have the long lead times for tooling for for hardware components mm. and you need to understand that then you need to freeze it for the hardware components okay. Uh, but you still can have it open for software development until a very, very late late stage or a, a very late gate, or that you even can update your software, software after the production of the vehicle, because oh. in the future there will be more and more software updates, meaning That's that true. you will enhance the capability of the vehicle even after it has been produced. Yeah. So um, I think that this with understanding that you have different different paces in the, the development of different components is important to understand and also then that you open up your software architecture in the vehicle so it's easy to come with software updates over the lifetime of the vehicle will be an is essential. Uh, you have to work very closely with your suppliers and you have to be very open and transparent and you can also not be over demanding uh, because you have to have some kind of uh, rules in that game as well. Mm. How agile do we have to be? What can we expect from our uh, from our partners in the complete supply chain? Because no one can go from zero to hundred and from hundred to zero. Mm. So so there must be there must also be some kind of uh, uh, some some kind of rules in the game of flexibility as well. There are a lot of electronics in the vehicle and every supplier will come up with some Models or components that has a lot of software. So, how do you integrate those software? What are the challenges that you face? Now, for us, it's very clear that more and more of the competitiveness of a vehicle will be decided based upon software. So, we have decided very clearly that we will be, we are, and we will be even more the orchestrator of the software system on board of the vehicles. Uh, we are investing a lot into future electronic electric architectures mm -hmm. that will uh, give us even further possibilities when it comes to data, data collection and, and also then further possibilities to, uh, to update the vehicles then with the newest software. So, so we see it as a very important step to be the master of the, of, of the software systems on board and then that doesn't mean that we need to code everything internally, but we need to have very clear interfaces towards our suppliers so that we are sure about what they are delivering into us so that we can integrate it in the most efficient way. Countries like India play a role. What do you think India can offer in this technological development of our world? So, uh, the reason why I'm in India now then, is that uh, India is so important for us in the world group when it comes to research and development. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, Bangalore is now our second biggest site in the world. Uh, the biggest is in Sweden, where we are headquartered. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are growing in India, we are growing in Bangalore. I'm really proud to say that all through the pandemic, we continued to grow in Bangalore. And we have growth plans mm -hmm. going forward as well. Uh, so, very important player in the global system. And since we only work with global product platforms, uh, the team in Bangalore, India, they are working on the global platform. So it's not solutions only for India that they are working on. They are delivering end-to-end -end solutions that we plug into the global product platforms. So when we, for example, launched the new Volvo heavy duty trucks in Europe last year, uh, there were a lot of solutions on those vehicles that were developed here in Bangalore, India. And when we are working on different projects now in Europe or North America, a lot of the work is being done then by the engineers here in Bangalore. So they are 
truly an integrated part of the global system and that's the reason why I'm here. Let me ask you about you know, electric vehicles. You already have uh, some electric vehicles, electric cars in the market. Going forward, what are the changes that you will bring to the electric vehicle, electric truck? What, what we see today is that we are on the market both in Europe and North America when it comes to trucks up to approximately 26 ton. So you can imagine, for example, a refuse truck in a city or a distribution truck in a city. Now we have solutions already today on the market. Next step is that we will go up to the truly heavy duty trucks, battery electric. We will start production in Europe this autumn with um, heavy duty trucks up to, uh, uh, up to 44 ton. And then we are really talking about the heavy duty trucks. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a very important step for us. That's a step for our customers. And by that we will address a much larger part of the market then. Then gradually we will increase the available energy on board of the vehicles so that we can reach more and more applications than going more and more towards demanding long-haul operations. But their fuel cell electric vehicles will also play a very important role because with fuel cell electric vehicles it's easier to get more energy on board on the vehicles and it's then quicker to fill up your vehicle with the fuel cells. So that's the reason why we believe in both these two technologies for heavy duty trucks going forward. Okay, so the 44 ton, uh, ton truck that you said, so when can we expect in the market? In, in Europe, Europe, in Europe, Europe you can see it in the market already this year in the autumn. Okay. In the end of this year we will start to deliver the first ones to customers. So in, in customer operations in Europe before end of this year. Of this year. So uh, there clearly then once again we are pioneers, we are the first ones out to really in serial production when it comes to this kind of vehicles. Okay, and about uh, the fuel cell vehicles? Uh, the fuel cell vehicles will be ready for commercializations in the second half of this decade. Okay. The first vehicles are up and running, so we are running a lot of tests on the vehicles right now. So full development right now in the second half of this decade. It's also rather well aligned with the development of the green hydrogen mm. because it's of no use, you know, that we are de de developing, delivering vehicles, be it battery electric vehicles or fuel cell electric vehicles, if the customers will use, let's say, fossil based electricity or fossil based hydrogen. You have to have a parallel development of the energy as well. That's interesting. Lastly, I would like to get your perspective on the, you know, the megatrends that is driving the transportation industry across the globe. So the megatrends is uh, to start with clearly then decarbonization. Mm -hmm. uh, and for me then uh, it's very clear that uh, we see uh, a big movement when it comes to hydrogen. Uh, and the green hydrogen is taking off. Uh, why it is so important for us is also because we see that other industries is picking up uh, steel industry, chemical industry, and then all of a sudden we can sort of piggyback on their need for <coughs> green hydrogen. Less than 10% of the hydrogen that will be used in the future will be used for transportation. And by that we can almost say tick in the box there will be green hydrogen available in society. The same goes with battery electric vehicles. The development of batteries is so promising. Mm. So if you go back and read papers five years ago, not many people believed at all that you could talk about a 44-ton battery electric vehicle. Today, this year, we will start production, not for true long haul, but with the fast development of batteries, you will see it in true long haul in a few years as well. Then you have autonomous vehicles, self-driving vehicles, which, which is also a global trend in our industry. And over the years, a, there has been a lot of talk about autonomous vehicles, also in past cars, but it's really in commercial vehicles where it will take off. That is where you have the business case. Yeah. That is also where you have the true uh, need for it. With high mileage, it will be rather expensive solutions, a lot of... Uh, lot of um, uh, highly sophisticated sensors on board on those vehicles but with our customers businesses they can afford it because they will have the business case so that's also another very exciting area and that means that you know I've been in this industry for 30 years now and uh, 
it has never been as fun as today to be an engineer. <laughs> this is the era of engineering in our industry. I think Volvo has uh, tested uh, autonomous vehicles, you know, the diesel powered autonomous vehicles you know, in the mines. Yes. Uh, do you see, uh, I don't know whether it's already available, electric autonomous is available in these mines? No, it's still not available. We are still uh, then uh, on the, uh, on the using combustion mm -hmm. engines, but, but there is no. Uh, there, 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 there's no difference in between the system that you would use when you're driving autonomous. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's just about looking into the operation of the customer. If it would fit better to use uh, electric vehicles, we would definitely certainly put that together as well. So uh, uh, today when we are talking about the early phases, uh, it is with combustion engines, mm -hmm. but in the longer run, and this is a clear requirement from many of the customers that we are talking to. It is to combine the different technologies, electric and autonomous. And that will definitely be the future offering out of the world. Yeah, I think especially in conditions like mines where you have to go up and then go down. Yeah. So electric will help in you know, the regenerating and the battery charging will be in less. Correct? Yeah, and no, I mean, it's a great way of uh, recovering the energy. Yeah, then. And uh, I mean, the best use case if, is, of course, if you can go up unloaded uh, and, can and then come down unloaded, <laughs> then you can Fantastic. almost be energy positive. Yes, energy positive. Yeah. So, uh, so that would be the most beautiful business case, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mr. Van for your time. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. much. Thank you.